Oi, oi, wagwan, everybody. It's your boy Agostino, and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 100. One zero zero zero. We made it. We fucking made it. And because of that, even though it's the midweek and I really shouldn't, cheers. Salute. We have actually made it. We've made it, man. Oh my God. What a journey, eh? What a journey. It's taken me a lot longer than I expected to hit the 100 mark. Because, you know, as I previously might have mentioned before, I, I wasn't really that consistent with my podcast previously. Um, I was doing it, but intermittently, you know, I wasn't really specking out doing a, a certain amount of week and stuff like that. And I wasn't consistent in doing it in a number of weeks. And as I'm sure most of you guys know, anything you want to do in life, the, the best way to do it well or the best way to learn and to kind of gain new skills and to gain new experiences is to try and do it consistently. And even if you decide to drop it, even if after the 50th episode, I thought, you know what, I'm over this. I'd have a better impression of what it means to have a podcast and I'd have a better idea of whether or not I want to continue doing one if I do it consistently. So having done this now for the last few months consistently, having put out at least one a week, right? I'm aiming to do at least two. And if I could do three, that's amazing. Having done that each week, I've now realized, you know, it, I've now, it's kind of dawned on me um, how horrible the first couple of podcasts must have sounded like, you know, like imagine uh, number one, I was recording it um, on a dictaphone, right? No, I, first of all, I started recording my podcast on my iPhone. I just recorded my iPhone on voice memos and then I'd upload the, uh, the clip onto GarageBand or to like that. What's that? Other, there's another free um, MP3 editing tool. I forgot what it's called. And I kind of use that and then upload that onto my file hosting system. And then from there, I graduated and got a dictaphone because the audio was a bit crisper. And then I kind of uh, speak into a dictaphone like a microphone. And then I kind of upload that into the hosting platform. And then suddenly, you know, now over the last couple of months or the last few six months, I bought a USB microphone. I bought this nice kind of webcam that I use as well. And I'm going to upgrade the camera too, hopefully soon. So over that period of time of doing it consistently, it then required me to go out and get more, like, better equipment. And I think it goes back to what Casey Nassar said a long time ago, or he says quite often in his videos. It's never about the equipment. It's never about the gear. It's always about what you do with the stuff that you have. So some people would, would get, you know, some people get paralyzed with the whole idea about what camera should I get? Um, what bag, what this? Just get something that's within your means now. And then over a period of time, the more you start using it, the more you realize, okay, I need more from this or I need something that's better quality. I need something that can offer me more options, um, more creativity or more more options to do more creative things. That's why you do it. But you have to start with just like basic stuff to begin with. So if you are thinking about doing a podcast or you are thinking about, I don't know, do anything, just start with anything. Like start with your iPhone. If you're going to think, think about vlogging, vlog with your iPhone. Start with that. And over time, you'll start realizing, okay, cool. I don't like editing on my phone. I don't like the, I don't like taking up too much storage. You'll get a new camera and then you get an entry level one. Then you find, suddenly get to mid and you get to high. Because there is a logic that exists out there where some people are like, no, I want to get the best thing first. But I sometimes think getting up, trying to get the best thing first, especially if it's not in your financial means or just getting the best thing first, it puts too much pressure on yourself to use that thing to the best of its ability. I think, in my opinion, right? I'd much rather buy something shitty but use it a lot and then over time realize I need something of better quality and then buy something higher quality, have the pressure of trying to use it and then feel really bad that I haven't used it and then not, not shame, but feel like, you know, you haven't used it as well as you could and then not touching it again. People do that quite often. So just start off very small and then you can hopefully get a level you want to get to. But yeah, it's been a great experience. I have to be honest. Um, I've had fun, man. hundred podcasts. I honestly cannot believe it. Um, I, I don't really listen back to every, things I record, but I have listened to one or two things from the first 10 or first 20 and they sound fucking horrendous. But, you know, I was kind of getting my shit out there again. Um, this is a very selfish pursuit. It's something that I've kind of done just because I want to do it and I think it's fun. And I listen to a lot of podcasts as it is anyway. And I've always feel, you know, in terms of things that you enjoy, things that bring you a lot of happiness or bring you a lot of knowledge or just take up some time in your day that you're bored. I think it's good to contribute yourself to it in some way, shape or form, whether it's spreading the news about podcasts that you like and sharing it with a friend or whether it's recording something that you like or even or even commenting on something and sharing some comments and talking to the community within that podcast group. I think it's good to just to give back a little bit with something you enjoy because, you know, as you as you probably know, with people flipping out or people of um, fame or some sort of notoriety in the public flipping out, I think sometimes it's it, obviously it's because a lot of the people take you know they they take too much stuff personally and they're looking at the wrong things. 
But I think there is also the aspect of it, like, you know, for the million people that listen to a podcast, usually the most vocal uh, people are the, are the minority who don't like you, right? And they're the ones that leave comments and are nasty or say bad things. But the ones that do enjoy it, don't say, say anything. Like, I know for me, I don't necessarily leave a comment on someone's podcast and say, oh, I really enjoyed it. I just listen and keep it moving. But I think sometimes it's nice if you are listening to stuff and you enjoy it, or if you, even if you don't want to record your own thing, it's good just to like reach out and say, hey, by the way, I like what you're doing. This is amazing. Keep doing it. Oh, that point in that point, that point you said in minute 41 was really funny. It's, I don't know, it just makes people feel good, especially, and it makes them just, just think, okay, cool. Even though I'm getting this hate, there are some people out there that do enjoy it. So I think it's good just to kind of give back. And my way of kind of giving back into the um, podcast ecosystem is to record my own. And I'm really happy to do it so far. And it's been, again, it's been a 100, it's been a journey that I knew I'd kind of get there. I could have got there really much sooner because I started my podcast two years ago. So to only have hit 100 now is quite bad. But you know, I'm kind of rectifying my mistake and trying to go forward from now and record as much as I can. It's been a bit of a break since I recorded last week because of the whole bank holiday weekend and I had a lot of DJ gigs in between. But I'm now back on the saddle and ready to go 100. We're just going to keep it moving. We're not going to dwell and celebrate too much on this thing and just kind of, you know, just keep on hustling. Because every day I'm hus, hus, hustling hustling hus you don't really hear that too much now when you go out do you every day i'm hustling i'm glad there are some songs that just kind of even though they're funny to mention in a kind of jokey way you don't want to hear them again sometimes You're like Ugh, again this fucking song um so yeah here we are back again anyway how's your week been how's your weekend been you dirty mofos how have you guys been have you guys been all right did you get up to anything on the bank or the weekend hang out with some friends get fucked up um if you're asking about my bank holiday weekend, it was pretty calm and tame for what it could have been. I did have some big plans in the works, what I wanted to do. But I also had this weird, I also had this um, nagging thought in the back of my head that I'm going to go to Berlin. Did I mention anything about Berlin in the last few podcasts? I probably have. But um, I'm going to Berlin um, at the end of the month. So I kind of didn't want to spend too much money. I kind of wanted to save some money and put that to the side. And plus, I've got some bills to pay. So you're just kind of like moving money around and thinking, okay, I don't want to spend too much now and regret it later. So I'm, I'm trying to get better at money management, right? I'm trying not to do that thing I did before where I just close my eyes and try and withdraw. And if, it, if I hear that sound, like, dee -dee -dee -dee, then I know I'm broke. Do you know what I mean? But I'm not doing that anymore. I'm now managing my money a little bit better and trying to take more responsibility because I'm a fuzzing grown-up, all right? You're a grown-up. Take responsibility of yourself. So, um... My bank holiday was pretty tame, primarily because of work and then secondarily because of my DJing gig. So I had I had to work on a Friday and a Saturday. Um, Friday I ended quite early so I could quickly go home. I changed and then headed off to Tap East and played at Tapped alongside my um, good friend Afro Musa. So that was amazing. Um, played it from 7 to 11, had a good time there, enjoyed myself. Everyone had a good time, you know. I'm, I'm starting again, like playing somewhere regularly every Friday. You're starting to get a bit of the hang of the a bit of hang of the whole DJing skill. I'm understanding the crowd a little bit more. I can read them. I can see what they want. I can gauge it. I can give them what they want. Give give them a little bit of something that I want. Kind of like a little to and fro, like I mentioned a few times before. And then usually after I finish at Tap East, I usually you know gather my stuff, get get up and try and like go out somewhere else. Um, the last few occasions I've gone to Mix Garage in Hackney Wick. Um, and I went, I think I went last week or the week before that. And they had a Pussy Palace party was on there. It was amazing. I think I mentioned that before. Really, really great party. Probably the fullest I've ever seen Mix Garage in my entire time, time going there. Uh, great crowd. Loads of like queer LGBT type people in there. All having fun and expressing themselves. I always love, I love just going to like a really gay night. And just seeing the joy and the glee on people's faces. Just because, you know, I, I'd imagine everyday life sometimes can throw up some obstacles you know people talking shit about you um really narrow-minded people casting judgment on the way you live your life or your lifestyle so i really like just going and witnessing people happy you know like um the idea of birthdays i fucking hate birthdays right i hate celebrating my own i hate when people celebrate it but sometimes i i can't help but smile and have a warm fuzzy feeling when i see a group of girls or a group of guys out on someone's birthday and they're really they're kind of like all the attention all the love is being given to that person it, it makes me cringe right it makes me uncomfortable i feel a little bit like come on grow up you're a flipping adult you don't need a pat on the back you don't need to be told happy birthday and shit but a part of me is also like wow that's lovely do you know what i mean people have taken their time out of their day out of their week to to kind of like curate this whole list of events, especially when people do the birthday weekends, the birthday week for this person just to show them how much they love them. So going to like a gay night is kind of one of my weird 
uh, kind of um, hidden pleasures that I have. You know what I mean? Something I just love to do. Just, kind of, just to see how, people, how happy people are. I guess the same. I guess it might be the same for people that kind of crash people's weddings, right? That go to people's wedding parties just to like be around all that love, right? Um, so that was nice. So, but this that, last week I, I decided not to go to mixed garage. I decided to, you know what? Let me be sensible and go home. Primarily because I was DJing again on the Sunday, right? So I, I came back home on Friday, but I was thinking, you know what? I'm working on Saturday, Saturday morning. I tried to get out my, I tried to bang out my work as quickly as I could, and I uh, managed to get it all done before two, or I think about two or three. So I got that all out of the way, and I kind of held the whole day free, and I had the house free too, so I can kind of rest and just take it easy. And then I was gonna think, I was thinking of going out. And doing other things before you know what let me just stay and chill then halfway through when i woke up i got up i think i must have got up quite late on a saturday because I, I worked and i had a bit of a nap and then got up again at about four and i decided you know what let me go to stratford shopping mall and try and get some bits and bolts for carnival right because not your carnival happened this weekend um and i was kind of in two minds about your carnival right because um i guess i'm Again, I'm not, I'm not, I hate the whole age thing, right? I hate, oh, you're getting old and this is not for you and you need to let things go. It's not something that I kind of prescribe to, you know? I, I think you're only as old as you feel and I feel great. I look after myself, I eat pretty healthily, uh, you know, whatever I work out and stuff. Um, I'm pretty mindful of not taking things to an excess. So I don't think that can apply to me, but there was a part of me that was kind of thinking, you know what? It's carnival, it's once a year. It's kind of the one of the rare opportunities where you get to kind of go out outside and listen to music really loudly right in a kind of residential area like kind of like a street party sort of thing we don't really have many of those in london anymore you know i'm assuming i've, I've spoken ad nauseum about the whole hackney licensing laws thing whatever so a lot of that stuff has to do with that and plus you know into general the uk is kind of a bit of, we're, we're a bit of enemies of fun we like fun but we like it in very controlled settings right we don't like spontaneous bits of fun right in terms of like street parties or people playing sp um, music out loud in the streets or in parks and stuff we're not really we're kind of against that we're a little bit conservative in that regard so not your kind of was a good ex good time to kind of ex um, escape um the kind of mundanity of everyday london life and just kind of enjoy you know this kind of shared experience of like um, lifting up this different, it's kind of like Caribbean culture of music and food and shit. It's really nice, right? Just kind of go and kind of experience it all. And um, so I thought, yeah, maybe I'll go carnival. But then I, there's also a part of me that I was thinking, you know what? A bank holiday weekend sometimes, uh, so bank holiday weekends feel a lot like New Year's Eve, Halloween, um, or whatever, right? Where I think people build them up so much, right? That sometimes the opposite is sometimes true. Sometimes, if a Halloween falls on like a Friday or a Saturday, because sometimes Halloween doesn't fall on that day, right? The actual Halloween day, it kind of falls on a weird day. I'm not sure what, what day is Halloween fall on 2018. Let's see, Halloween 2018. Um, let me see, I'm checking the date quickly to see what day it falls on. What day is it fall on? How many days is the day? This year, October 31, which is what? Is that, is that a Monday? Is that Tuesday? Let me see that. Check this out. October 30, what, October what, 31st, right, it's a Wednesday, cool, so sometimes Halloween doesn't fall on a good weekend day, right, it falls on like on a weekday, so people have to kind of do this weird thing where they delay it, or they go the week before, it's a weird thing Halloween, right, but people build it up so much, that sometimes I feel like it can sometimes be a good opportunity not to go out, right, because it's like going out to Shoreditch or any kind of popular metropolitan area on a Saturday night or a Friday night. Sometimes the OGs, right, the real clubbers, people that really know how to get fucked up, will prefer to go out between Wednesday and Thursday or Wednesday and Friday because usually you avoid all the kind of like chances, all the people that kind of just want to go out just because, you know, they want to be cool or they just want to tag along with their friends who kind of go out normally. So you can kind of avoid all the hassle and all the trouble and hustle and bustle by just going out during the week. But sometimes I feel like those days can get built up so much. I mean, everyone could be like such on fire that it sounds like it could be a good idea just to kind of like, you know, I'm going to take a step back and not go. So Nono Campbell was one of those things. And this year too, with the rise in knife crime in London, the police presence was ramped up. Anyway, even though it's ramped up every year, um, this year, I think they had the most the, the most amount of police officers, I think, in Nottingham Carnival, I think like 13,000 of them. But then the, 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 other, the other side of the story was that this summer has also been one of the best summers we've had in London or in Europe overall, right? Most of Europe has had like great uh, weather, loads of sun, um, really high temperatures. So I was thinking, you know what, it might be actually a good time to go carnival. But I was also thinking, if I do go carnival, if, if I do, if I do, it had to be a Sunday. But then, of course, I remembered I can't go Sunday because I was DJing at Heathcote and Star. So I was DJing Heathcote and Star from five until like, I don't know. I was meant to DJ from five to one, but it ended a bit sooner because it wasn't as full as it needed to be. 
um, which was a bit of a shame, but you know, these things happen. Um, so I thought, you know, what, I can't go on a Sunday, which is the kids there. I thought, let me go on a Sunday. I could just chill out. It won't be as rammed. It won't be as crazy and have a good time. Unfortunately, I was DJing. Then suddenly Sunday comes around and it's raining. So I'm like, oh, absolutely great. But then I was also thinking, oh, my DJ set. No one's going to come now because it's raining, right? Because usually, again, Bank Holiday weekend, if you, give me, if you give me rain, I'm not DJing. That's an excuse for me to stay in instantly. I'm staying in. Do you know what I mean? I've, I've got such a low um, uh, endurance or weather endurance threshold now since I've kind of like stepped away from going out in like more trendy East London. Do you know what I mean? I've kind of like, because I live in Stratford, to kind of get out there you kind of have to decide you want to go out right you can't just if it's raining and you got doubt in it and the time is ticking away you have to realize that by the time you get to, you time you get to the other side of the or by the time you get to like central east it's going to be about 40 minutes right so you kind of have to account that's so every every time that you're waiting after 8 p.m the trains are going out every 20 minutes so you can't have to decide very soon whether or not you're going to go so i thought you know what it's a blessing but it's also a bit of annoyance for me on sunday but then again, when I went to after I did the Heathcote Star, which was you know a bit of a mixed bag, but it was it was good in my, for my for myself anyway to do it. I played like a bit of an extended set. When I finished, I also kind of thought on the way home. I was walking back. I was like, you know what? Um, maybe I'll go on Monday actually because it's going to be nice weather. It's going to be nice and warm. I can meet some friends who live in West London. We have a good time. Then Monday morning comes around and I end up waking up quite early. I woke up about 11 in the morning or something. And I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of an old lady in that regard where I wake up and I immediately go to the window and start, you know, a bit start, um, twitching the blinds and looking at people walking down the street. Happened to, when I happened to look out the window, I happened to catch a group of girls, right? About four girls walking down the street going to carnival. And they were dressed to the T, right? Amazing outfits, um, kind of a sheer kind of top on with with uh, cut off denim shorts, nice trainers, little bra tops, glitter everywhere. Everyone with massive bums and shit. Like young, I don't know, maybe let's say under twenty five, right? And I was like, wow, I'm not, I'm not those girls. I'm not ready. Like I am not ready. Of course, I'm not those girls. You know what I mean? I'm, I don't look as hot as they do. No way. Uh, especially if I was a girl, I definitely wouldn't be that hot. Um, I'd definitely be the girl if I was there. If I was if I was a girl, I'd definitely be the girl that would turn up there in a pair of tights because I felt uncomfortable. Um, so I knew I, I couldn't be those girls. I just knew, I wasn't ready like that. Like they looked like they had prepared their outfits two weeks in advance or a month in advance. They bought it. They bought some bits and pieces from ASOS or on Depop and stuff, and they've kind of gathered their bits together, gone Amazon, bought some glitter. Do you know what I mean, like they look like they were prepared. Like they all went to one person's house. They all got changed, had some pre-drinks. They had probably some gin and tonics in their bags and stuff. Like they were ready. And I was like, you know, I'm not ready. I didn't have it. Not. Even though I don't take outfits, I don't usually buy outfits to go carnival. I don't think I don't can't remember the last time I'd have both. the the most I'd do is just maybe buy a whistle or a hat from someone of the stores right there. I'm not really an outfit y kind of guy. I'll just make do I, I always have uh, big aspirations to buy an outfit. Like, oh I'm gonna buy an outfit. But then it gets around to it, I never really bother. So I didn't buy an outfit. Oh, I didn't find one actually on Saturday when I went out on Saturday. So when I went to backtrack. When I went on Saturday to go check uh Shafford Shop and we'll see if I can get something to wear. I couldn't find anything, but I ended up finding like a string vest T-shirt that I bought. But I was like, I'm not going to wear this, man. It's not happening. You know, I'm just not, just not going to wear a string vest T-shirt. That's just not me. So I, I decided to just like leave it. But I thought, you know what? Let me just have it in my wardrobe. You know, you never know. You might need a string vest T-shirt. And there might be something I might wear in Berlin, you know, for the techno parties like, oops, 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 with a big chain on. I actually need to get that. I need to get like a massive industrial chain and put like a carabiner on it and kind of wear like a necklace. I saw some guy doing that fold when I went there um, a couple of weeks ago. But, um, I said, look, I ain't got an outfit. I'm not going to go. And also, I, it just wasn't, you know what I mean? I thought, you know what? Let me just chill. Let me just chill out, man. I had quite a steamy night, a steamy weekend. You know, when you DJ, you get given so many free drinks. So you end up just, you know what I mean? Just end up after having a bit of a fog. Plus, you're standing up. It's a weird experience, actually. Playing, you're DJing, right? So you're kind of enjoying, you're enjoying yourself, having a good time. But you're also working. You're also thinking about, you're also thinking about not fucking up, right? You're thinking about doing a good job. It's different. I guess it's different if you're one of those DJs that plays in like trendy East bars where you don't have to care about what anyone wants to, what anyone wants to hear. No one's going to ask you for a request ever. I don't think if you're DJing in Dawson, I don't think anyone's going to come out. Can you play that? Can you play this? It doesn't really happen. I'd, I'd imagine so, right? If you're playing Haggerson Pub, like you just, you just allowed to play what you want. Um, or I don't think there's that pressure. Let's say there's not that maybe that social pressure. Where you feel like you have to play to the crowd. So. There is a bit, there is an aspect of it where you're like, you're kind of overly stressing out. You're, might, you're kind of have weird mental fatigue where you're like, oh my God, you're worrying that you're not doing a good enough job. So you're always on, I'm always kind of attentive. I'm always kind of looking. I mean, I've got the kind of like crackhead look. I'm looking left to left to right, just to make sure all the, the Sergio Bush gets look, right? I'm like checking my shoulders, right? 
all the time. Every two seconds, check, check, checking my shoulders, right? So the fatigue when you finish, especially after, you, after you've been drinking a lot, is very strange. I don't have to describe it. It's a very, very odd feeling. But then on, this, on the other hand, when I have DJed a few times, because I've done it a couple of weeks, where I've DJed completely sober, just drinking water, it's also very strange because you're so on edge. You're so aware. But maybe I, I haven't tested it long enough and two weeks is not long enough to test whether or not I can do it um, for the near future sober. But it's very difficult to DJ in a nightclub completely stone or sober. I think attending one is very easy because I've done it before, right? I've gone to nightclubs myself on my own with no drugs, no alcohol, plenty of times. Um, I've even gone out after work with, with friends for, for like, quote-unquote drinks just to hang out, have a chat, and I've been all right. But DJing, being in the booth and music blaring in your face and selecting songs, it's very hard to do that sober, especially because you just end up being so tense. You just, end, you just, you just feel everything. You recognize when a girl leaves the dance floor. You recognize when this guy kind of makes an eye roll when you mix something that he doesn't like. You recognize every single bit and it doesn't throw you off. So I guess maybe the, the trick when you're DJing sober is maybe to kind of not pay attention to that sort of shit. But it's very difficult not to. I guess the same thing if you're a stand-up comedian, right? Some, some guys, I'm sure there's stand-up comedians out there that get blackout drunk so they can just like ramble through and not notice people's social cues. But there's also some that kind of, I know Joey Rogan speaks about it, where he kind of likes to have like a drag on a cigarette. He doesn't smoke, but he just likes to have a drag just to kind of get that nicotine rush, right? Or maybe some people like to have like little shots just to kind of get itself stable. So maybe that might be an option. Like maybe just like, not, not just dr not drink, but just have like a shot or something, right? Like a Zambuca or whatever. Um, so yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of difficult. But I think that kind of, uh, it kind of um, centered me. I was like, you know what, I'm not going to go on Monday. So I just decided to sack it off to carnival stuff. And I, I don't know, I guess when you don't have Instagram, because I, I don't really use my Instagram anymore. I haven't used it for like maybe a month. I've kind of, I've kind of just logged out of it and deleted it from my phone just because, you know, I just wanted to kind of concentrate on doing Because again, it's, it's, it's no coincidence, right? I don't have an Instagram on my phone. I mainly use Twitter and Facebook, which I don't use that much anyway. And there's no coincidence that I've been able to um, podcast a lot more often. I'm not writing on my blog as more as I thought, as often as I wish I would, but I want to write on it every day, but I'm not doing that as often. I need to kind of implement uh, something in my calendar that allows me to kind of carve out time to write every single day because it's not hard, right? I just want to write a, a blog entry a day. It's not difficult to do. Um, Seth Godin does it every single day, so I can. I want to try and do that somehow. But it's no coincidence that I don't go on my Instagram anymore and suddenly I've been so consistent in making sure I get a podcast out and making sure that I'm DJing. My DJing kind of thing, bookings have kind of ex increased exponentially. There has to be a coincidence. There has to be a, a correlation there somehow or the other. And also I'm just like, I'm, I'm very, um, I'm kind of, I'm calm, right? I can just make a decision socially and not feel bad or not feel like I have any sort of FOMO. I don't feel as if like... Um, I'm missing out on something really big. It's just, I just didn't go, right? Um, you might see bits and bits on the news about the carnival. You might see the obligatory picture of a girl dancing with a guy, with a police officer, whatever, right? It's cool. Um, I saw some bits and bobs on Boiler Room from them streaming. Again, I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel like, oh, wow, I shouldn't... Pfft. Nothing at all. And it's, I think... It, I don't know, man. Maybe it has to do a lot of social media. Maybe it just means to do with me. My focus has kind of changed, I guess, right? Because... I've seen a lot of people on social now. I saw some guy actually the other day post something like, oh, my friend's going to take my phone away from me and do it. Like something super, super, super extreme. Like just so she should stop using social media. Like my friend's going to lock my phone in her, in, her, in her safe for a week. It's like, don't need to go that far, right? Just eliminate one or two things that take up too much of your time. Whether it's Twitter, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook. And just use them sporadically. I don't know. Say you're going to use them nine to five. Treat like a job. And after 5 p.m., you stop using it just to kind of give yourself a better balance. Because I think a lot of people that are like that, because, again, it's just, again, what you want in life. If you want to succeed, if you want to do more things, if, you have, if you're not finding time to do the things that you enjoy outside of work, you have to. You have to substitute some of those blo um, time blocks for things that you enjoy. You have to because that's what's taking up your time. If you could take away um, 20 minutes of staring at your phone when you're on the central line and maybe read a book, that could get you closer to reading a whole book, like if, if that's your goal, right? If you can maybe take out an hour that you spend on Instagram or an hour that you spend watching Netflix to maybe write some of your poetry, um, to maybe practice some new hairstyles, so we can maybe make a makeup video vlog or tutorial, you'd be on your way to getting to where you want to get to. But I think sometimes people get too extreme with things. And again, like I'm saying with the whole, like me doing a hundred podcasts, right? It's like, um, everything has to be, oh no, I have to get the right camera. I have to get a studio. I have to, I have to get, no, no, no. Just start what you have and then, 
if over the period of, over the time of you doing it during the course of that journey or that hustle of that effort you will discover what you need to do to get to the next level or you discover the pain points that you have that you need to address or the things that you need to improve on but start with something start, start very very small and you know i remember that's how i started my kind of reading stuff like my journey on the reading was primarily when i used to work in shepherd's bush that made it a bit easier because it was like an hour journey either way right so it's like instead of being on my phone or listening to a podcast cause i do that every day anyway i'm gonna just read a book and i ended up just smashing through books monday to fr- and, I, and i only did it monday to friday i didn't even extend it to saturday to sunday i just said i'm just gonna do it monday to friday because that's the time that i have hour there hour back smash through it smash through loads of books and that's that's kind of how you kind of start doing these things but Again, like I said, I don't think it's a coincidence that since I've not been on Instagram and not doing this, it's like been a bit easier. But I think when I do come back on Instagram, I'm just going to do what I was kind of doing before, which I kind of got into bad habits before, but I was kind of doing it before where I would just post and drop the phone. Like I didn't really engage with my discovery page. I didn't really leave comments. I didn't like pictures. I was just uploading my stuff. That was it. And if I need to comment or reply to people that are replying to or comment on my things, then no worries. But I wasn't actively going into a wormhole and looking at people doing stuff because again, I think it's a great pla- I think it's like a it's a great sort of like social Behance. You know that Behance, that website where people that do um, graphic design can upload their portfolios and shit, or like how Flickr used to be back in the day with photography. I think Instagram is great to kind of get out your to kind of express yourself right your lifestyle to kind of showcase your art your skills but i think sometimes as well because of the flatness of social media the fact that i can i can because i've got social media account on instagram i can then be the same as somebody else has done a wholly different career trajectory than me it kind of creates this weird kind of like mental despair where you kind of feel like you're never you're you're not going anywhere right plus you're comparing your likes that person's likes you're seeing you got 20 that person got 1500 and it's like how how soon am i going to get to that level like i'm so far behind right so that can kind of be the bit of the issue and it can kind of get in your head and you can kind of feel sad and i think again like i mentioned previously i think that's what's the primary cause of most of the kind of quote-unquote mental health issues that are going on especially in youth nowadays i think a lot of it isn't like your conventional mental health issue right where you're really depressed or you have real mental health issues where you have to take time off work and it's really bad for you i think it's another form that we haven't been able to kind of articulate or point a word or uh, diagnose but it is that kind of flatness of social media because i can be you know effectively if i have an instagram account i'm the same as kim kardashian right um maybe our follows are different maybe our likes are different and all that sort of shit and she gets paid more than i do to post stuff or she gets paid and i don't but we're the same so if I'm in her, if, if I'm trying to do something that she's trying to do, I'm always com- n- dumbly comparing myself to her, which is dumb because it's like comparing yourself to Messi and Ronaldo, right? But there's plenty of footballers out there that are making a good living, supporting a family, uh, playing for a great club who don't make 100 million a year, right? They might make 30 a year, right? But they're playing the sport that they love. So it's about that comparison. It's a, it's a weird, you're making an odd comparison. You're, you're, the flat, Instagram makes you make the comparison with the kind of like top 5% or 1% when really you should be comparing yourself to maybe someone that's in your in your vicinity, right? In your kind of ballpark. But Instagram doesn't do that because you automatically see the people that are kind of killing it right at the top. But I think a good way to do it is to kind of just post and dump. I think what Jogan mentioned the other day, actually, just post and dump, just post and dump. Post, just use it, use the app because I think the app's amazing for discovering stuff. I've discovered, I've discovered loads of things on Instagram like hotels, hostels, restaurants, uh, galleries to visit, um you can sometimes i maybe i remember one time i found a dj gig on there like you can discover loads of shit like really cool stuff great accounts to follow um some of the meme accounts are hilarious like that um kept flicks and chill the kind of like clubbing one that's really cool there's loads of really great um accounts on there um so it's amazing to use but i think you have to just be careful you have to be, be careful because i think again there's too much reliance there's too much in reliance on it. And I think for the people that are trying to hustle, who are trying to make it, are trying to do something with their lives, I think you have to be very aware of how much time you're spending on it and how much time you're not spending creating, or how much time you're not spending promoting, advertising and pushing the stuff that you're doing on social media. I think that's the way people are getting it fucked up. I think if you just want to be a regular human civilian and just want to chill and have a good time, then use as much as you want. But even then, even if you just want to be a civilian, I think that's to be... Um, there has to be a bit of a, a a bit of discipline, self-discipline in terms of making sure that you're not on it too much. Because again, like it's just you know, I don't know. It's just I don't believe in the whole like you know people should be looking up more and talking to more human beings. I think that's a bit you know that's a bit trite and a little bit of an easy cop out. Like oh I'm, I like it back. To, I like I like I liked it back in the day when we re- were riding in horse and carriages. No, I don't believe in that kind of whole aspect. I do believe in balance. 
just have balance that's basically it and be a well-rounded human being and if you have goals and dreams maybe spending seven hours a day on instagram or on social media in total isn't a good idea um but it, but it doesn't mean you should go and give your phone to your friend and tell him to lock it in a safe just use your stuff again because i think it's lack, lack of accountability use your self-discipline Dis- like d- d- discipline yourself to make a change and go from there oh to my dis- discipline did you guys see this um that is it that kevin smith what's his name that kevin smith twitter kevin smith um he's kind of got he's got a podcast called smodcast listen to back in the day he's been on joe rogan a few times and just an all-round amazing dude he directs movies and stuff but if you remember like a few weeks a few months ago he had a big health scare where he had a bit of, he had a stroke um at the at one of his comedy shows right so he was in the back room or the green room and he kind of felt a bit weird and he had a he had a mini stroke effectively right so he could, effectively he could have died so it was really really grim shit right and he's got a really horrible story about how his dad died screaming in a suit. So that's why he kind of dresses like a big teenager, right? Because he kind of wants to never be... He never wants to be that serious where he's crying in a suit. I mean, he's screaming for his life in a suit. He kind of wants to just take take life and not, 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 not be that serious. But he had a big stroke and kind of had a bit of a big health scare. And he had that moment, He had that thing in his life where you get told... You know, sometimes in life you get these little messages, right? Like, I got it the other week, I think a couple of months back when I went out a few times and I felt like absolute shit for an entire week. So I was like, you know what? I'm not that guy anymore, right? I'm not that party guy that can go out from Wednesday to Sunday every week. I can't do it. I have to pick and choose my battles. Because, I again, because I'm, I'm aware that I enjoy stuff. I enjoy going out and having a good time. I enjoy getting wasted. I enjoy it, right? But I'm not going to then turn around and say, oh, because I had a hard time when I went out, I'm now going to stop going out and abstain from everything. That's just not who I am as a character, right? That's not me. If you know who I am, you know who I like. You know I like speaking to strangers. You know I like disappearing. You know I like reappearing with random friends and stuff. You know I love that shit, right? Adding people on Facebook and shit. I love that. I love being the center of attention in a nightclub or holding space. I just, I just have to admit that. But I have to do it in spits and spurts. I have to do it spread out. But you also do get along that time. You also get these little micro messages that the universe keeps giving you like, look, you're not that guy, fix up or don't do this, do this, do this, whatever. So we've all had those over time. But the, I think one of the big lessons in life, one of the key things in life that makes it life a bit difficult is that some people don't heed those messages. They don't listen, right? They just ignore it. I think, nah, it's all right. Nah, it's, all, it's okay. It's just, it just a fluke. These things happen, right? And instead of taking it as a big lesson for you to learn, right? For you to kind of change course and correct where you need to go to. And Kevin Smith did that. He got a massive health scare and he decided, you know, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change my lifestyle. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to become more healthy. And even before then, he was quite he was quite healthy. I think he lost quite a bunch of weight before the whole stroke thing. But he took it even more seriously when the, the stroke did happen. And now he posts a picture on Instagram. I mean, I saw on Twitter that I saw come up on social, um, on, on Twitter mainly, that I thought I'd share with you guys so you can see as well, if you can see it here. And he lost, I think, like 60 pounds altogether. And again, I'm just talking about accountability, right? Because of the whole, like, you know, I'm going to give my phone to my friend because I'm using Instagram too much. Like, this is what accountability looks like, right? Something really shitty happens to you and you decide, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm going to now take control of my life. And I think the caption reads something along the lines of, you can find him on Twitter. His name is um, Dat Kevin Smith. So T-A-T, T-H-T, uh, Kevin, uh, spelled the usual way, K-E-V-I-N and Smith, S-M-I-T-H, right? And he writes on Twitter on August 26th, six months ago yesterday, I had a heart attack. The doctor told me to lose 50 pounds. It was a heart attack, not even a stroke, my bad, right? The doctor told me to lose 50 pounds, but I have a problem doing what I'm told. So I lost 51 pounds instead. Read about it here absolutely amazing right so he decided to kind of make this change just go on instagram see what he said main tweet as you can see i'm not signed in so i think it's going to give me a little warning thing it's, it's annoying does it so i keep it always wants to sign in which is annoying but um yeah so this is um him posting on on instagram about the whole occasion so i'll read the caption a bit so you guys can see it here um this is weight watchers ambassador is thrilled to announce that i've lost 51 pounds six months ago from right now i was in hospital recovering from a heart attack and i had um the night before, when I went to my doctor a week later, she told me the best thing you can do for yourself now is lose 50 pounds. Half a year later, I can report that I followed the doctor's order. I started at 256 and now I'm at 205. This is the lightest I've been since I was in high school. My hope now is I can slowly lose another 10 pounds with weight watches and get down to my birth weight of 195, which is amazing, right? But for now, I'm ecstatic to have reached uh, this chunky milestone. I want to thank uh, the person I read the book for getting me started on the on the potato famine and the good folks at Weight Watchers for their app-based program that made it easy to keep track of the control of the eating. And I also want to thank my kind, my kid, uh, Harley Quinn, that little vegan restaurant who explored 
this meatless, milkless galaxy ahead of me, um, leading by example. Since I've ne since I'd never wanted to see the inside of a hospital ever again, I simply copied the kid. Uh, so this wasn't a diet. This the, these results came from a total lifestyle change of eating solely plant based foods, which I which is tough because I eat, hate vegetables. But mostly, I want to thank all of you as well for the kind and encouraging words along the way. Never underestimate the power of positive feedback. You thoughts give telling me I look better or healthier help me stick with it. Which is again, which I go back to what I said about if you enjoy people's podcasts and enjoy people's things on, on internet let them know i know i don't do it enough but let them know but again that's the thing about personal accountability so instead of you know locking your phone away and doing these drastic measures just take control of your own life um people don't do that often enough there's a lot of indulging of people as the way they are right a lot of like oh, i'm accepting who i am i'm loving myself which is great right premises start yourself you should love yourself you shouldn't hate who you are right but you should be all you should also be trying to become the best version of who you can be it's a very cliche thing everyone always says it but try it's very hard but then again it's very difficult to do same with jordan peterson's advice about cleaning your room it's something that's a lot difficult to do than you think it is right because cleaning your room requires you having to dis, you know make the admit admit to yourself that your room is a complete tip right that you haven't been you haven't got your room in order so you might mean so most likely your life isn't in order too right i've known a few people who like cleaning up who like organizing things who say it's very cathartic it makes them feel good because it, it allows you to be in control of one thing like even i had this weird little tick that i do sometimes where because i hate being employed and i'm not doing my own thing just yet but i hate that fact that i have to go somewhere and earn my money and kind of exchange my time for money but you know you have to kind of do things in order to kind of keep a roof of your head and make sure you're fed and stuff so i'm not i'm not that against it but i kind of do this weird little thing this tick that i meant i realized i do over the years where before i leave the house i make sure the plates are clean i make sure the sink is tidy just because i want to have in, i want to have one thing in control i want to have big command of myself right command of my space another thing that i do that i noticed in terms of taking accountability i'm taking control of my own life is that before work i'll try and do as much as i can i'll run i'll record a podcast i'll try and write a blog i'll do loads of re the co constructive things i'll try and meditate i'll read a book just so i just so i feel as if like they're not taking away all my time it's a weird way to think about things right i know in general it's a bit strange but that's how i kind of kind of you know use my time and take control of my of circumstances and i think people don't do that too often enough man they don't do that enough often i don't think so there's too much of this acceptance of like accepting you for who you are right now which is great but you should be striving to be more than you can be right or at least trying to push the limit and seeing how far you can take yourself right that's kind of why people run that's why running is so popular because you know everyone has that moment when they're running or in a race where they kind of feel like they should stop they feel like it's too much. They kind of feel like they can't do it. They can't do any more anymore. But you do. You power through, and at the end of it, you get given a little goodie bag with some protein bars and a medal, and you're like, "Fuck, I finished." That is nuts. I actually finished this. Like forty minutes ago, I felt like dying. I felt like you know, I felt like I, I wish there was an invention invented that could lift me up and somehow dump me in my house. I'm directly on my bed, right? But no, I stuck with it and I did it. It's such a good feeling to have, like to know, wow, I can actually do really difficult things because sometimes in life you don't know that. You're not aware. Can you really handle adversity? Like, are you able to? Because a lot of people don't, right? A lot of people are like, you know, if you hate your job, you leave. If you don't like your girlfriend or boyfriend, you dump them. If you don't like your friends, you find new ones. If you don't like your trainers, you buy other ones. People usually don't handle adversity very well. They just kind of run away from it, right? Or they kind of just close their eyes or put their head in the sand. But sometimes it's good to kind of like stick with things and be like, you know what? Even though you're my friend and you're a fucking bitch, right? Or you really annoy me. You did something to me that really hurt my feelings, right? I'm not going to just dump you, right? I'm going to stick with you and I'm going to try and help you recognize what you did wrong and try and m help us grow together. That is sometimes a good thing because it builds character. It kind of allows you and your friends to have a different kind of connection. It's a weird thing that happens with adversity. But again, I think, you know, I, I think we're as by our nature, we're risk adverse. Hum we're risk adverse, right? Because I think risk maybe is a, it's kind of, maybe it's a, um, it's something that's ingrained in our ancestry, right? Being risk averse because, you know, we're quite fragile creatures, right? Compared to like most mammals and stuff, you know, we don't have a tough outer layer. Um, we, we can be bent and broken quite easily, right? We don't, we can't really run really fast. We've got endurance, we don't really run really quickly. We can't really jump higher. We can't really climb up high things without adequate training. So maybe the whole risk adverse thing is a good idea in order to kind of preserve our lives, preserve uh, the ability to kind of spread our, sow our seeds if we're a man, if we're male. Or the ability to kind of uh, reprocreate the earth if you're a woman and stuff. But I think, you know, life for the most part is the ability to sustain the amount uh, more kind of like knows than the other person, right? I think that's what life is most about. Like, can you 
can you put up with having more rejection than the other person? And if you can, you'll be successful. You know, we've all heard the story of someone sending a, a script or a proposal for an idea to 35 agents and being rejected by all 35, right? But it's that perseverance that gets you to the next level. Maybe it's not in that industry. Maybe you're, along the way, you might find out that actually your talent lies in being in the manager and agent, but just going f consistently showing up is what kind of like defines um, success or kind of sets people apart for the most part. But again, people don't do it. So I think Kevin Smith's a good example. Hopefully people use him as a, as a, as a guide. I've kind of saw it and very impressed with it. I've kind of been a bit of weight loss training myself so far. I think I've lost about 10 pounds so far, which has been great. Not as good as I hoped it would be, but you know, it's been awesome too. But it's, it's great, man, to know that you can do it. So that was something I saw that I thought was interesting. Anyway, what else I want to talk about before I close out? Oh, United. Should I talk about a bit about United? I hate talking about football in here because I get just so upset. But um, fuck it. So as you as you guys are more are well aware, I'm a big Manchester United fan. Have been supporting these guys for a long, long time. And, you know, we're kind of going through a bit of a rough period at the moment, right? We're kind of in this position at the moment where... It doesn't seem like there's a clear wet route out of the forest, right? We're just like lost, right? Um, everything kind of doesn't work out. We're trying to get good managers in to kind of fix a problem that doesn't work out. We're trying to sign players of a high caliber or big ticket, I, big ticket players or players of a big reputation. It's not so seem to work. We're trying to sign people that are proven in the league. That doesn't seem to work. Loads of things we're doing just aren't working. And I think it kind of like come to a head when we faced Tottenham the other day on Monday Night Football and we lost 3-0, unfortunately, right? The game started off pretty well. I think everyone was surprised by Jose Mourinho's tactics. Everyone was kind of assuming he was going to play Matic in centre-back and kind of have like a five-man defence. But instead, it kind of turned into like a three at the back with Herrera behind there, right? And kind of Shaw and uh, Valencia playing as like really wide wing-backs. And it worked amazing for the first half an hour. But unfortunately, we didn't take our chances. We had a couple of chances to score, especially Lukaku who had a kind of an open goal to score into and he missed. And then you kind of knew what was happening because it was weird. When you watch them game, right? I remember there was a period where some commented said like, oh, why is Pochettino going so crazy on the side of the bench, right? He was kicking stuff. He was remonstrating. He was really angry. And the reason why, because I think we were playing really well, but it was obvious that Tottenham are a better side than us. And as soon as they score, because we don't really have a, a defined style of play and because we're in a weird transition period and a lot of our players having beefs with the manager, it kind of felt as if Pochettino knew that if they take control of the game, they would win. But if they gave us a chance to score, that we would gain confidence and win, right? It's the same thing. I think Mourinho mentioned after, after the game that got, got, scoring goals and conceding goals has a weird effect on your cardiovascular ability, right? You get a bit deflated when you, when you lose. That's why people are really shocked when teams come back 3-0 because the whole team's morale kind of drops when, you, when, you lose, when you're losing 3-0 and there's 20 minutes to go. But it takes a really extraordinary team spirit in order to kind of like, no, it's not over yet and somehow score three goals or four goals to win the game or four goals or more. So I think Pochettino had a feeling, an inkling that if they score, they'll win this game. And I kind of had a feeling that too, like uh, the Premier League is the Premier League because you can't play shit against a Tottenham and win. You can do that in Valen You can do that uh, in Spain. You can play crap against Valencia and still sneak the win if you've got world class players in your team. But in the Premier League, it feels like even if you have world class players in your team, there is the possibility that you could get you could get a draw. It's not going to happen the same way you think. Same way when Man City went to Wolves and everyone thought they were going to win seven 0 and it ended one one. Right, a very tight game. Uh, Wolves had a very great a great tactical plan and they kind of executed really well and they limited Man City's chances. Um, you know, they hit the post a few times, but for the most part, it was a very very even game. But you felt as if like if Man United conceded that they were just going to lose the game, and it, exact, it happened exactly to that T. Um, we, we conceded kind of on the first corner and it, we just basically imploded. Um, then you got to see all the cracks and the holes in our team and you got to see that as great as a plan as Jose Mourinho set out before the game, it seems as if the players aren't playing for him because the moment we went down, there wasn't a concerted effort to kind of get us back on level terms. Like we didn't have a way of playing, which is what kind of like really annoyed me when Luis Van Gaal got sacked and we got Mourinho in because... Even though Luis Van Gaal's signings, some of them didn't work out and the football was dire and we kind of, you know, were, were kind of stagnating at the time. You saw what he was trying to do, right? There were moments when we faced some of the bigger sides where we played them completely off the park. Like I remember we faced Liverpool once and we just dominated the whole game. Possession, we played great football. It was amazing to see. You saw where it was kind of going. But with Mourinho, you kind of get the feeling or you know the fact that his style of football, his kind of managing style depends a lot on having good players, right? You look at Porto, you look at Inter Milan, you look at Real Madrid, you look at his time at Chelsea. He had the best players available to him or he was able to get the best players he positioned. Like, I remember there was a time at Chelsea where they had that thing of like having two, two world-class players at each position, right? 
just so he can swap like for like. And that's when the whole idea came. He didn't play kids because he didn't need to. He could just go out and buy ready-made talent, 25 and upwards, and just play them, right? In a position of, 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 um, of strength, and then the team would win inevitably. Especially if he implemented his kind of tactical now in terms of defending, in terms of pressing the ball. He's very good at that, but it's very dependent on having good players. He has to have good players in order to make the system work, right? And with United, as anyone United fan knows, we don't have good players because we have a lot of dead weight in our team. We still have Smalling, Jones, uh, Young and Valencia in our defence, right? Five players who it could be argued all need to be shipped out, right? We then have uh, Luke Shaw, who's someone who hasn't really fulfilled his potential, but is someone played really well. Probably the man in the match against Tottenham, actually. Great performance. Weird to say, because we lost, what, 3-0 and Lucas Moura was tearing up the pitch. But Shaw played really well for United. Then we have a midfield where he still contains Fellaini. It still contains Mata, who no one's really sure about. Um, then we have an up front that's a bit haberdashery, a bit cut, a bit stuck together. It doesn't really make any sense. You've got Rashford, Martial, Sanchez and Lukaku. All players that different managers would like and not like. Systems that don't really work. Then you've got Pogba, who's a marquee sign, hasn't really worked out. So all in all, the team isn't as good as other teams that Rose Mourinho has walked into. And it required much more of an overhaul than any other team he's ever had in his career, ever. It, it required, it's required so much work. This is, this is a proper six-year job. He needs to get a lot of players out of that club, right? But it seems as if the board has decided that he has spent so much money and we haven't been able to see any benefit from it so far in terms of leagues or Champions Leagues, right? Um, that they feel as if like he needs to get the most out of what he has now before he gets uh, given any more money. But again, like I mentioned, if you hire Jose Mourinho, you have to be under, you have to understand that he's not Louis Van Gaal. He's not going to promote Rashford from the reserves and play him, and all of a sudden you're going to find a gem. He's not. That's not his style. He doesn't do that. He signs ready-made talent and makes them play well for him. And if he doesn't have the, the tools to do that, we're not going to be good. But I also am a bit reserved, reserved on uh, have reservations on that kind of system because. I don't want United to be that club. I don't think we can sustain that either. I don't think that's a sustainable model to make. And I don't think we can be that club, right? I think a lot of our heritage is built, even though it's mostly built on the back of Sarah Ferguson, is built on promoting the youth, fast attacking wing play and counter attack, right? It's always built on exciting football, but it's also built on a brand of football that kind of uses really kind of outside of context, ordinary players, and but kind of gives them a platform to play their best, right? You look at people like John O'Shea, right? Someone who kind of was a bit average, but in that team was able to do a shift, do a role. People like Darren Fletcher, right? Who was like a, a better version of a Fellaini, right? Someone who was actually able to play football. Maybe not the highest level, but he could play different kind of role, different, he could play in different positions all over the, all over the team and give his 100%, he's giving entire all in it. And then we supplement that with just world-class talent like Skulls, Giggs and Ronaldo, but that's how we kind of did things, right? But it feels as if like we don't have a plan set in place. So I'm a bit nervous to say that Mourinho should go because I, I, I do think that it's not going to work out. I think he's made such a rod for his own back. I think he's alienating too many players. I think he's been unable to kind of adapt to the modern footballer, right? If you're a Pogba, because Pogba's been horrible, right? Since he's played for us. I think he's been not, he's not been consistent. He's not justified his price tag at all. We've seen the best of him in the France kit for the most part. But for United, he's been pretty average, right? He's not, he doesn't control games when he's given an option to. Even when he has like two defensive midfielders in Herrera and Matic playing alongside him and all he has to do is pick up the ball and spray all over the pitch. I, I say all he has to do, but you know, he's, he's more than capable of doing it. He's not, he can't do it. He's flat to deceive, right? For the most part. But modern day footballers like Pogba need a different kind of management style, right? I don't think they... Well, I, again, I don't know what the stories are. I'm not, I don't have any inside information. Again, I'm a nobody. But I don't think he can act... To, I don't think he can um, treat Pogba the same way he treated Luke Shaw. I don't think he put up with it. He's too big time, right? He thinks too highly of himself to put up with that kind of... Uh, um, uh, to put up with that kind of behavior from his manager in public. He won't do it at all. And if you leave the stories that Pogba is a bit distracted in Manchester, he's always out all on social media. Mourinho doesn't like it. Friction in that regard. There's videos of him in Paris. I think, no, after the World Cup, uh, smoke, um, puffing on helium balloons and supposedly he has a girlfriend that does coke, allegedly. Blah, 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 blah. So there's all, these con there's all these things around him that people are saying is not that, that are kind of making him distracted. Plus Mourinho, after the World Cup, ha threw a bit of a snide remark, which I think was unnecessary too, right? I'm sure they already had a conflict, but he threw a bit of a snide remark where he said something along the lines of like, Pogba only did well in the World Cup because he had no distractions, right? It's the World Cup. He had, like, he, had, he had to kind of be locked in a hotel with his teammates and he couldn't be out and about doing things. And that's where you see the best of him. Hopefully he can do the same thing in United. So kind of like a little backhanded compliment. So with all these things in place, like Mourinho, unfortunately, it's, it doesn't seem like he's a manager who can get the best out of a player like that. 
and Martial's kind of the same sort of player too, right? A bit, um, young players who kind of haven't achieved that much, but think very, very highly of themselves, right? And unfortunately, Mourinho's kind of education as a manager has, has come from, you know, dealing with actual real pros, right? Which is partly the reason why Ibrahimovic did so well when he was at United, right? Because he was able to kind of implement that kind of like hunger, that kind of like professional kind of go in, do your job. And then outside you can do whatever you want, but on the pitch, you have to perform. Right, that kind of driven desire, but he doesn't have a, a, a Ibrahimovic anymore. He doesn't have like a second manager on the pitch to kind of bring people in and make sure people behave. He doesn't have that anymore. So he had kind of in this weird impasse. But again, like I mentioned previously, if you want Mane to succeed, Mourinho has to be given the funds to buy the players that he needs to buy. It's a bit checkbook managery, right? He has to, he's not a coach that can kind of um, get the best out of shit players, right? Or promote ordinary players, make them play well, or get the best out of a dead system. He can't. He needs great players. He has to have world class players. He just can't do it. Pep Guardiola did the same sort of thing in that regard, right? He got rid of Benjamin, Benjamin, uh, Bukari Sagna and Zabales and all those kind of guys and Gail Clichy because they weren't good enough, right? And he replaced them with the players that he needed that uh, could do the job to the level that he wanted to do. So Man United kind of needs to do that. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to say Mourinho out because the board don't know what they're doing, right? Um, Ed Woodward's obviously proved that with the appointments he's made from Moyes to Louis van Gaal to Mourinho. There is no common theme there. They're just following a succession plan that doesn't make any sort of sense. So if Mourinho does get fired, what are we going to do, right? He's gonna, that manager's going to come in and have to sign six more players. He's gonna have to, it's going to take him a year to get rid of the people that are on big contracts. That's not fair United too. Those ordinary players I mentioned, like Shaw, no, sorry, Smalling, Jones, Valencia, uh, Ashley Young, who's going who's gonna to sign them, right? They're on like 120 grand a, a week, supposedly, right? They've still got contracts that have like a couple of years or three years left on them. Like, it's hard to get rid of the players like that, and especially if you don't want to terminate their contract and lose any money on it, right? So we're in a weird position, we're in a weird stage. I feel like that, again, the 3-0 the loss to Tottenham was more than on the cards, right? It was coming. I think we kind of got away with it a little bit against Leicester, but we didn't get away against Brighton. We didn't get away against Tottenham. And now we're in a position where we kind of had to rescue our season, right? Do you remember when losing two games in a season was meant you out of the Premier League race? Like, you, you weren't going to win the Premier League anymore. People don't really treat it as that sort of, like, cutthroat anymore. But remember that being a thing. If you lost more than two games, you're done. Like, it's over. Um... So maybe that ruthlessness with the top teams isn't really there because the teams from fourth to like tenth are so good now, right? So they can, it's never, it, there is no gimmies anymore. Even the, even relegated sides for the end of the season, it's not a gimme because you need the points, they need the points to stay alive. You know what I mean? To like actually keep, people need the points to, stay, to keep their job. It's that serious. So the league is like a weird place now where like the top teams have to really, really, really play well in order to kind of win and you have to have the best players available and if you don't have that, it doesn't happen and you have a manager who's kind of beefing with the players, beefing with the board, like it's just a whole clusterfuck of shit that's happening at the moment, right? It just doesn't, nothing seems to be working and you can see it. Like the moment we go behind, the players that should be kind of performing for us at like the Pogba's and stuff and the Sanchez's are just not being able to kind of pull us out of the rut and I guess... There's a part of me that's kind of happy that's happening because I think it would be a bit of a cop out, be a bit of a an easy cop out for some people if we did get out of a rut because Sanchez came on and scored like a 35 yard screamer. I don't think that's what we need. We need to kind of actually go down to the dark place and realize that we are not where we need to be because of the infrastructure that we have set up in the club, right? We don't really have footballing people doing the footballing side of things, right? We have chief executives that are more business business oriented than Ed Woodward, who are kind of trying to handle both sides of the business, and they can't. Um, and we have a we don't have we have a plan in place, a blueprint of what we want to do, right? Mark specking out the next five years because I think again. I'm, I'm saying it's going to take us, us another five seasons to get back where we need to get to. Like, actual dominance. Like, Man United being the Man United of old. Not flirting with, you know, finishing top four or pushing to finish second and shit. No, actually challenging. Because even though we finished second, we just finished second. We, did, it, we, we didn't look like we were going to win the league at any point in the season, right? Maybe apart from November-ish time. We don't, we don't really, we don't really challenge it for the league. No, I don't actually believe that we were going to challenge Man City. But I think it's going to take us five seasons to get back to that level. Honestly, five seasons to get back to that level, but it requires a plan. It requires someone to sit down, footballing people to get footballing people in charge, to kind of co to look at the youth system, what we're doing with the reserves, what we're doing with under twenty ones, under twenty twenty threes, what's going on with the under eighteens, what's going on with guys like Tahiti Chong, what's going on with these guys, like how are we pro trying to plan that to progress them into the squad, what's going on with the players that we have already signed, like we have to do that, we have to manage that, or if not, we're going to be stuck in the doldrums. We're going to end up like how Liverpool were a few seasons back, or AC Milan. Uh, another really bad example of a big club that kind of just didn't handle um, just didn't handle the kind of transition of not winning stuff really well and we need to kind of handle it but again 
I don't have much faith in the club because I think like, money is always the driving force. And if Mourinho is able to kind of make us finish third um, in a very tight seat, because imagine, I'd imagine I'm, I've got a feeling this season's going to be a lot tighter. I don't think Man City are going to run away with it. They did last season. I think it's going to be a lot tighter. So if we finish third and it's like eight points b- between um, third and first, I think they'll see it as a successful season. We've got top four. We guaranteed the Champions League. Funds will be made available again for me to send a couple of players. We'll still have the dead weight left in our team. Like there'll be things that happen, but I think we need to kind of like the shit needs to hit the fan in order for us to change. But I don't really want it to happen because I'm a, I'm a fan of the club. I don't want us to lose another game or to lose a succession of games and then to get handed out. I don't think that's the way he should be going out either. But he also needs to kind of like find a way to kind of correct it and fix this because you know he he makes eight changes or six changes in a game against Tottenham and then I'm sure there's going to be another round of changes again like I, we don't know who our best centre back pairings are Lindelof looks like he's absolutely scared to play football Smalling and Jones are as average as they always seem it's just like an absolute clusterfuck I don't know what's going to happen but we're in a bad position right now um, I don't think I'm not sure how, how much better it's going to get and if it does get better then so be it but I don't really have good feelings or hope regarding the season overall but anyway um I guess that by me, me again. I don't like to at football because it just bums me out again. But you know, say lovey, you gotta get these things off your chest. But yeah, that might be a good place to end it. Um, but before I leave, actually, I recommend you watch this TV show that I'm watching on BBC called The Bodyguard, right? Or Bodyguard. It's an amazing show made by the same makers that made this TV show called Thin Blue Line, um, which I was a real big fan of. Kind of like a, a police sort of um, espionage, backstabby sort of crime thing that was amazing and they've kind of done they kind of hit out the park again with making this story called with making this um, series called bodyguard with stars the dude that played rob stark in the game of thrones and it kind of based on him being a bodyguard of this um, member this mp his home secretary was kind of like conniving in the background sort of like west wing style to become the prime minister and um, but the, the the mp that he's protecting she's um she's uh they kind of differ on their kind of political um, points of view right she was for the war he obviously fought in the war and has ptsd and saw the actual real life shit that's happening on the other side and saw how it got politicized and how the soldiers got used as pawns so there's a weird sort of friction happens between the both of them in terms of like you know he kind of vehemently opposes her political views and you know but he has to protect her um with his life effectively and it's called the bodyguard it's on bbc i rec- highly recommend you watch it it's an amazing amazing tv series and uh, the bbc absolutely smashed it um it's a shame that it's on the bbc and you don't get to watch the whole thing in the you know don't get to kind of just like binge watch the whole thing but it's something definitely to look forward to before all the other big series start before um, next year, right? Game of Thrones still happens to have, we still have to wait next year, don't we? Annoying. But yeah, highly recommend you watch The Bodyguard. The Bodyguard on BBC iPlayer. Check that out. Anyway, this has been the Exynos English Show episode number 100. 100, 100, 100, 100. We're looking at rest of our laurels, like I mentioned in the beginning. It's an amazing achievement. I'm happy that I'm able to share this journey with everyone that listens. Uh, so big up yourselves if you've stuck around for this long. Whether, if you joined in the 50s and the 60s and 70s and 80s, wherever you joined along the journey, thank you so much. I owe all of this uh, minute, uh, very inconsequential, but very appreciated success to you guys um thank you so much for tuning in and you know thanks for whoever do, does leave messages and sends me words of encouragement i don't need them right? i'm not that kind of person but it is very very much appreciated and i'm always you know getting back to you guys and saying thank you so thanks for everyone that left messages and encouraged me to continue um even those that don't want me to continue i will continue because you know it's something that i kind of am interested in it kind of a self, bit of a selfish pursuit and I love it, I love it, I love it. So I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the x Zing Show. But it's been an episode number 100. Um, I'm taking a break for a couple of weeks DJing why so I won't be DJing most places um, until probably, I think, the next couple of weeks. I might have a gig in the Heathcote Star coming up at the end of the month. But I'm taking it easy until then. So it might be nice to kind of like recuperate, do some mixes, you know, again. I might not be DJing, but I'm going to do a mix at home. Just kind of, you know, hustle and kind of make sure I do that thing and get myself lined up for the whole full season. But if you want to keep abreast of anything i'm doing cross social check out my blog all that stuff then please visit the link at the bottom xnozinga.com you'll be able to find all the links to stuff that i do and i'll see you guys again on the other side tomorrow very very early in the morning for another episode of the xnozinga show with me your host agostino thanks so much for tuning in peace love all those around you and take care of yourself bye